So thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you were able to make it. I know it's been a really crazy week and a crazy year, um, but let's get a little bit lighthearted and make some turkey lentil tacos with various toppings today. So before I jump into the fun food stuff, I wanted to address a couple of quick safety concerns. Um, first of all, when you're setting up your cutting board, which we're gonna be using for every element of our meal today, uh, you wanna make sure that it's not sliding around like a skateboard. So what I've done before you arrived is I took just a paper towel and I got it a little bit damp and then spread it out beneath my cutting board. And now if you notice, I'm pushing as hard as I can on this and it only just barely budged. So that will keep your uh, cutting board from sliding around and um, the possibility of you accidentally cutting yourself. So another issue before we start cutting is the proper way to hold a knife. Um, this is something that I learned only just a few years ago and I was really resistant to embracing it because I used to cut like this or like this and that's not the most stable and safe and secure way to handle a knife. So what you're gonna wanna do is take the very end of the blade right where it runs into the handle and pinch it with your forefinger and your thumb, right like that, and then wrap your remaining three fingers around the handle. That way you've got good control as you're cutting and you're less likely to cut yourself. So today our recipes are turkey lentil tacos. That's the main event. Um, but then we also wanted to do a couple of fun recipes for toppings. So I've got pico de gallo, as well as a homemade guacamole that we're going to be doing on either side of the lentil turkey recipe. So first I thought we would start with our pico de gallo. And the biggest reason for this, um, <laughs> it doesn't quite do it justice with the short hour that we have, but if you allow your pico de gallo mixture to sit for a few hours, sometimes even overnight, then those flavors will meld together and your pico will be even better. So first let's start with the onion. Now I like to use red onions because they're more packed with nutrients and antioxidants than white onions. Both are very healthy, but I like that extra pop of color. It makes everything prettier and you can be sure that you're getting a few extra nutrients. So I've already peeled this onion. I have all of the, the yucky outside skin that's tough that I peeled off. And I also cut off the end that is not the root. I hope you can see this from where you are. <laughs> but this is our root and that's the part that grows out of the ground. So these can never be perfectly clean. And the way I take that into account with the way that I cut an onion. So our first principle of cutting objects is you don't want this round rolling motion. That again is going to increase the likelihood that you'll cut yourself. So you always wanna work with flat edges whenever possible. So since we're only using about half of an onion today, and this is actually my favorite way to cut an onion, we're just going to really quickly saw down from the top to the root. That way our knife, which is nice and clean, isn't running that dirt the whole way through our clean onion. So starting from the top, you're gonna grip your onion with a claw hand, and that prevents you from chopping your little fingers off. Make sure you get it nice and steady, and then just cut right down the center and through that root. Just gonna wipe my knife off really fast because we don't want that dirt anywhere. And I'm going to save this side for later, but this side still has that root fully attached. So that is the part that we're going to be cutting around and I'll demonstrate what I mean. If you've noticed, onions not only have layers on the inside that go around, but also these little um, ridges that go the length of the onion. So those sort of make a natural longitudinal line that you can follow with your knife. And that's the easiest way to get a nice dice on your onion without having to come at it like this. I see some people trying to cut it like that. My number one priority is not to cut myself. So I wanna avoid doing this and instead just start right there from the root and work my way around the onion following those longitudinal lines. Remember to keep a safe grip on your onion so you don't go sliding around. And 
now that we've made it to the other side of our onion with about a centimeter for a medium dice. You can go a little bit smaller if you want a smaller dice or wider for a larger dice. Then you can move your onion to the opposite side and cut across those lines that you've just made. So as you come down, you see how that onion is falling apart and that's making a nice medium dice for us. Now, for this recipe, I'm making a smaller batch today. Um, this is really advantageous because you can use uh, a larger recipe and then prep that for the entire week. So this is really nice to have on hand throughout the week when you don't feel like cooking. It's very cheap and easy to put together and you only have to really cook anything one time. So since it's just me and my lovely assistant Heather today, uh, we're only going to make a small batch. So just know that you can, <laughs> um, you can always expand the size of this batch to prepare for more days or a larger uh, gathering once it's safe. So I'm gonna take half of these red onions and put it into my pico bowl. And the other half, we're going to set aside for our guacamole later, spoiler alert. So what you'll see me using right here is yet another anti-cutting yourself tool. Um, this is traditionally used in baking and pastry making. It is called a bench scraper or a pastry cutter. And you don't have to have this, you can use a knife, but when I see people scraping things up with that blade going toward their hand, that's a no-no, makes me worry automatically. So this is nice and dull, can run my hand along it all day long. And um, that is also a wider surface area that'll help you scrape up and distribute those ingredients. So I actually just got this at the dollar store. Anybody can get one, it's very accessible. You don't have to go to Williams Sonoma or Sir La Cobb. you can get a dollar store bench scraper. So I like to keep that on hand and we'll save the rest of that red onion for later. So the next item that we're gonna put into our pico is tomato. I personally like Roma tomatoes. I think they're very flavorful, but you don't have to use Roma tomatoes. You could use any other kind of tomato. I know that our hothouse tomatoes are around when tomatoes aren't really in season. Sad, it's getting to be winter, but there are lots of good options out there still. So I just cut the very end off because I don't like that hard nub at the end. And then I'm cutting the tomato in half with my claw shape again to hold it. And then on the inside, you have all your seeds, right? And I personally like my salsas, my picos to be a little bit juicier. So you can leave those in if that's what you want, but just for the sake of not making a mess today, I'm gonna scrape these out really fast. And you can just stick your finger in there as long as your hands are clean and just run that pulp out with those seeds. I only have a couple little bits left. And then you start cutting as a ribbon down very similarly to the way that we did with that onion and just make centimeter or so size slices. And then alternate so that you can get your dice going. Make sure that you have a sharp knife. I made the mistake of not bringing my sharpest knife today and that will help to keep your tomatoes from getting mushed and you'll still have crisp uh, cubes of tomato. So we're gonna take that with our bench scraper, add it to our mixture. And for the sake of time, I already made a few extra diced tomatoes. So we'll just add that you want a few more tomatoes than red onions, but I like a lot of red onions. So it's almost 50-50. Next, we'll demonstrate garlic. Now, usually you, if you're buying fresh garlic, you'll find it in a head like this. And it's very similar to that onion. It has that root down there. And then you just peel off the outer layer and pluck off your garlic cloves that then look like this. Um, so once you have your single garlic clove, now I never use a single garlic clove in anything. I use multiple garlic cloves in everything. But just for the sake of demonstration, we'll do one of these and I have more off to the side. So this also has 
a little bit of a skin around the outside that you don't want to eat. It's yucky. It's awful texture. So I take my knife, put that blade away from any of my fingers, and I just smush it a little bit. Now this has a two-factor uh, benefit. First, it cracks that peel a little bit, so you can just pull it right off, and it comes off of your garlic clove relatively easily. Boom, no more skin. And then by cracking it a little bit, applying that pressure, it activates some of the enzymes to make it even healthier for you. So I just cut off this little nub, because again, similar to that tomato, you don't want this tough piece. And now that I have my clove, a good way to get a small mince, which is a very, very fine chop on a piece of garlic, I usually like to cut through it um, horizontally. So first being very, very careful just to saw down. And then the other advantage is that you have flat surfaces. So place your flat surfaces down and then do a long ways cut across the garlic and then shift and line it up so that you can make little tiny cubes. And that will usually break it down to a larger mince. And then if you want it to be really small, be very careful when you're doing this, but hold your tip down on the board, grip our knife the way I showed you earlier, and just give it a quick little slap and that'll go the whole way across and make a smaller dice. Now I add that along with a couple of little tomato and onion scraps, sorry about that, along with a little bit more, probably another clove and a half to two cloves of garlic based on how much uh, tomato and onions we have in here already. And that'll make it nice and flavorful. Now, um, it's sort of debated as to whether cilantro belongs in pico de gallo. I say more flavor, more green, absolutely let's do it. So you can buy a bundle of cilantro. I think this was 75 cents at my local Kroger. Very cheap, just make sure you go through that. Or you can also buy dried cilantro. Um, we're gonna get to the rest of our spices soon and I'll elaborate more on that. So when you buy it in this bundle, you wanna make sure to give it a quick rinse in case there's any leftover dirt from where it was grown out of the ground. And then you can just strip it right off of that stem. You might get a couple of stems in there. As long as it's not the base of the stem, it's not a huge deal um, because it doesn't taste awful. It's not a horrible texture, but you can discard those or save them to blend up and make a nice sauce later. I'm personally going to discard them because we don't need the sauce today. Then you can take the leaves and sort of bunch them up into a rolling motion. So I'm bunching up my leaves and rolling, bunching up and rolling. And what that does is it creates a nice way for us to then run our knife down this line of leaves. And this is called a chiffonade. So it's not a very small chop and it doesn't damage the leaves, but it's just enough to release that flavor and make it a little bit smaller. Oh, it smells like cilantro in here now. This is wonderful. Even through the mask, I can smell it. So I just add a little bit of that into my pico de gallo. And now we're ready for what is almost our final step, might as well be, um, and that is some lime juice. And that will um, make it a little bit more acidic and get all those flavors melding together. So I'm gonna use almost a whole lime because I like it to be nice and acidic. Uh, and a nice thing that you can do with your lime to get more juice out of it is give it a roll. So I'm just going to lean forward and press my palm on it and give it a nice roll and you can feel it kind of giving. There's a little bit of a mush going on and that's just releasing the juice from those cells on the inside of the lime. All right, I can juggle too, but I'm not gonna do that today because I only have two limes. So we take our lime and I'm just gonna cut it across at the equator of the lime. You can do wedges if you prefer. Um, it's a little bit fancier, but I think this makes it nice and squeezable because then I just palm these and give them a good mush. Oh yeah, see all that juice coming out? 
it wouldn't have been nearly that good if I had walled it first. So that's a really good advantage. Add those to our garbage disposal. And now we have all of our ingredients minus a little bit of salt and pepper. It doesn't need a whole lot more flavor than what's already going on in there, but I have a little salt and pepper mixture that'll just bring out those flavors a little bit more. Now, we'll just give it a quick little stir and set it aside in our refrigerator because you want to keep it nice and cool and crisp, but give it a good stir and then set it aside for those flavors to melt and it'll taste even better on our tacos later. All right, so next we'll get to the main ingredients, which are our turkey lentil tacos. Um, so the reason that I like to do turkey and lentil is that it stretches that more expensive meat by adding in your less expensive lentil. Um, you can get these in a can. That's what I did just for the ease of today. But you can also get them in a bag as dried lentils, and that's even less expensive. But I like to take my canned lentils in a strainer. You don't want a colander with holes that are too big or you're gonna start losing lentils. Um, but you wanna give any canned food a quick rinse. Um, and that's just to get rid of the additional salt that is stored in these cans. So I'm gonna do that really fast. Kate, may I ask a really quick question? Absolutely. Um, are there any nutritional differences between uh, cooking the lentils from scratch in, you know, the ones from the bag, the dry ones, versus getting them in a can? Um, not necessarily based on um, their actual nutrient composition as the legume that is lentils themselves. But there are a few things that you want to note uh, when you have canned items. Like I said, sodium, absolutely. Uh, the juices that leach out of lentils and other legumes contain something called oligosaccharides. And those make you a little bit gassy sometimes. So if you want to avoid that, <laughs> I would cook um, some dried beans and just be sure to drain that water off when you're finished. Um, sometimes there are also a few other additives in cans. So just watch out for that if it's a concern for you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, but this is just a little bit quicker. So if you're pressed for time, just grab a can, rinse them, and throw them in your pan. Um, what I'm going to do is add a little bit of oil first, and we're gonna cook our onions and stuff as well. Uh, this oil that I'm using today is called Thrive, and it's an algae oil. So this is heart healthy omega-3s, and it also has an insanely high smoke point. And you want a high smoke point because if you're using a lower smoke point oil, like olive oil, um, the instant that you pour it in, if you heat it above a certain temperature, and that number is escaping me right now, but it's a very low temperature, it starts to smoke. And that is active carcinogens. And, you know, it also smokes out your kitchen. You don't want that. So I just added a little bit of fry with our high cooking uh, point. And I'm just going to move it around the pan there a little bit. You don't need too much oil. Um, because we're just going to be adding some of our onions. Now, since I already showed you how to cut our red onion, I just set aside some white onions that I cut earlier, and I'm going to dump those into our pan. Not too much, probably about half a cup, because I like onions. And next, I'm just going to give those a quick stir. So I currently have this pan on about medium low heat. I don't want it to cook too quickly, but you're already getting some good aromas of these onions. Now, um, you're going to want to let these sweat is what we call it when you're not quite sauteing. It's not a really high heat, but you're just going to let them sweat for a couple minutes until they get translucent. So not fully clear. I don't know if that's even possible really, but a little bit see-through and that's how you know that you're going to have a good texture with your onion. Now, I will add our lentils in just a moment. Okay, 
and a little bit of garlic too. Why not? We like garlic. Garlic tastes good. Um, but you don't want to put it in quite as early as your onions because there's more sugar in garlic and that will burn a lot faster if you're not careful. And then you have like kind of a negative uh, garlic flavor. Um, burnt, never fun. But you just get some of that in there. Make sure that heat stays low. And we'll give it one more minute to mix up and get that good oniony, garlicky flavor going. All right. Now we'll take our lentils and add them to the pan and sort of let those meld together for a moment as well. Just give it a good stir. Make sure it's pretty evenly distributed. Does that smell good? <laughs> Wonderful. <making> jealous. <laughs> Too bad you can't be here. Too bad all of you can't be here, honestly. I'm only used to doing cooking demos when everybody gets to try the food at the end. So it's very sad that we can't do that today, but hopefully someday. Now in the other pan that I have prepared here, I'm gonna do the same method, just a little bit of oil, and then I'm gonna add my turkey. So today I got some Jenny O ground turkey. And I think this is about four and a half dollars at Kroger. So this is one pound, which if you're making a few tacos, um, really you only need about two ounces of meat per taco. So there are 16 ounces in a pound. And so theoretically eight ounces, right? Not quite because you lose some of the content when you're cooking your turkey because it's very juicy. Um, so you can generally bet you're gonna have about eight ounces of cooked turkey with a pound. So that'll still last you for a few days if you're making two to four ounce uh, turkey meat tacos. Or these also come in three pound boxes and you generally get some savings with that too when you buy in larger quantities. So I'm just going to add that ground turkey to our pan. I'm going to wash my hands and we'll discuss why in just a moment. So meat, especially ground meat, and especially poultry can contain a lot of bacteria before they're cooked. So I have a separate spatula that we're going to use for our vegetable combination and our turkey combination. I'm just gonna break that up lightly with my spatula. And we'll get it stirring around a little bit. We're already getting a little bit brown there on the bottom which is not a problem, but what you're generally hoping for here once you have your turkey all broken up is that you don't wanna see any more pink because that is the exposed surface area of the raw meat that has that bacteria. And one of the main things in poultry is salmonella and that can make you feel pretty awful for a few days. So you wanna avoid that and make sure that your turkey is cooked all the way through. This is the same for if you're working with chicken. Always make sure that your meat is cooked all the way through, as well as hamburgers. Now, it's not quite the same pathogens when you're dealing with ground beef or ground pork, but they still have all that exposure to the air when you grind up a meat. So it's not the same with steak, but you can have medium rare or even rare if you like blood. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, as long as you sear the outside of a steak and make sure that the exposed areas are cooked to the appropriate temperature, then you can eat that just fine. But all of the ground meats that have been exposed to the air have the bacteria, so you have to cook the whole thing to the appropriate temperature. Now, our poultry is 165 degrees Fahrenheit for your safe cooking temperature. So um, I'm just gonna have Heather help me out by continuing to move that turkey meat around there, make sure it's fully cooked everywhere you look. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to give my lentils, garlic, 
and onion, another quick stir. And I have a secret for you guys. When I said this is one of my favorite recipes, it's true in some capacity. However, I don't eat meat, <laughs> but lots of my friends and family do, which is why I prepare the turkey for them. And I keep the onions, lentils and garlic separate so that I can set aside some for myself. So if you have any friends, family who are vegan or vegetarian, or just don't eat turkey, you can always do what I'm going to do too. So I take my spice mixture, which I have everything lined up over here. Um, I've used oregano, cumin, paprika, uh, coriander. You wanna make sure that you get the ground coriander and not the bald coriander, unless you do have a grinder and uh, some smoked chipotle. And I'm just gonna add half of that mixture to my lentils, garlic, and onion, and save the other half for the turkey so that everybody gets some good flavor. But first I'll mix this up. And I'm personally not gonna have any today, so I'll just mix it all together when we're finished. But that's how you would make sure that all of your veggie friends get some food when it's safe to have cooking parties again. Um, alternately, so I said I was gonna talk about our spices. All of these I've sort of gathered over the years, which you shouldn't hold on to your spices for quite that long, but I'm a broke college student too. Um, but an advantage that you have, like I said, Dollar Tree for our bench scraper, the Dollar Tree also tends to have a lot of spices. So you can go to any dollar store um, that has some food selections and they'll usually have some spice options for you. However, if you don't want to have all of these spices on hand, you don't have the room, you don't have the money to buy them all individually. Another option is the taco seasoning packet. Now I got this at Kroger, it was 35 cents, I believe. And it has quite a bit of stuff in there. It's 1.25 ounces. So that's 35 grams. I could probably make the amount that I'm making here seven or eight times over with this amount. So this is a great option if you just want to do taco seasoning, but you don't have a need for a lot of those other seasonings otherwise. While Heather is finishing up that ground turkey, one more point that I'd like to make. I'm very serious about my food safety and my appropriate cooking temperatures. So I keep a digital thermometer on me at all times. Uh, so before we finish here, I will definitely be temping our turkey. And how you can do that is to remove the thermometer from its casing, make sure that it's on and set to Fahrenheit, unless you're a Celsius person or you know that conversion or you're a mad scientist and you just understand how it works. Um, I personally am sticking with Fahrenheit because that's what I'm used to. And you're gonna insert this tip up to where it sort of widens right here, if you can see that, into the turkey or whatever other meat that I'm working with. And I'm going to hold it for just a second and make sure that the temperature reading goes up to the appropriate cooking temperature for that meat. Again, today we're using turkey and all poultry is 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna put that away for just a minute. And one more quick note on the thermometer. Once you temp something, if it's not up to temperature, don't just put it right back in that case. Don't carry it around on your arm. <laughs> You're gonna get yourself sick. Uh, because once you insert that dirty thermometer tip into a food that doesn't have to be cooked to the same temperature, you've now transferred those bacteria. So just make sure that you sanitize your thermometer after you've um, used it on something that's not fully cooked. I'm gonna give our lentils one more stir. And we're just gonna move them down to a low heat to simmer for a little while longer while I prepare our guacamole. You don't want it to burn, but you also don't want it to get cold. So we're gonna leave that like that. Um, one more step before we get to our guacamole, I wanna throw our tortillas in the oven. So all I have is just a piece of tin foil and I've set our oven to warm. You don't need it to be too hot. You're not trying to cook the tortillas, they're already cooked. But 
warming them up a little bit does make them more pliable, more flexible, because I don't know if you guys love corn tortillas like I do, corn above flour any day, but they can crack a little bit, they get a little more dried out. So you wanna make sure that they're flexible enough to bend them the way you want a taco to bend without crumbling all over the place. You don't wanna be eating your taco with a fork. So I'm just gonna take two tortillas you can do, I'd say up to five for this particular method. Um, and then that would only entail having a secondary tin foil piece. And I'm going to wrap them inside of our tin foil, just little corner to corner action so that they're all covered and in case. And now that I've got my little tortilla bundle, I'm just gonna pop it in our oven. It'll give it a few minutes while we're making our guacamole to come up to that nice toasty temperature and be nice and pliable. Now, for guacamole, um, we're going to start with avocados. Does everybody like avocados? I love avocados, they're on my ears. <laughs> um, and does everybody know the best way to select an avocado? Because that can be a little bit trickier. And even avocado experts may occasionally still get a lemon. <laughs> Not really, it's still an avocado. Um, but when you're in the grocery store, if you find one that's just a little bit, has a little bit of give, you don't want it to mush when you touch it um, or squeeze it gently, but you also don't want it to be super hard or a very light green. Even this is almost a little bit too light, but when they're a bright green like the cilantro, those are not ripe. They're not anywhere near ripe. Don't even bother with it unless you want it next week. But you also don't want them to be super dark brown or closing in on black. You definitely don't want to see any mold because then you have a mushy avocado that's going to be all brown and stringy on the inside. So when I grab my avocado and I feel one that has a little bit of give, not too much mush, I look at the stem and the stem should pop out relatively easily, which this one did. And then on the inside, you can still see some nice green. If you start to see a lot of dark brown inside there, if it comes out too easily, you're gonna have an overripe avocado and you don't wanna work with those. They're not fun. So the appropriate way to cut an avocado can be a little bit tricky. And I don't know if uh, you all are squeamish, but if you want a little bit of post-Halloween horror, look up avocado hand on Google Images because people stab themselves right through their hand on a routine basis, going to the ER, just trying to cut an avocado. So to avoid that, we're gonna take it and set it down on its side like this. Take our knife and very carefully cut into the avocado about halfway through. And then you're gonna hit this pit or the seed. It's technically a seed, but we often think about it as a pit. And once you hit that pit, you can just pivot around it, keeping your fingers out of the way and just pivot on that straight line around the pit inside your avocado. And then give it a little twist and voila, this is a beautiful avocado, if I do say so myself. Um, so personally, before I even get to that seed, I like to take that little nub off of the top because I don't want to eat it. It's just a little bit too tough. It won't hurt you, but it's yucky. So I just remove that little tiny corner to make sure I don't get that unpleasant toughness in my food. And then to get this pit out, this one is a little bit loose as it is. I could probably just turn it over and it would come right out. But for the sake of showing you the best way to get one that may be a little bit more stuck is to, again, keep your fingers out of the way and just whack it and give it a little twist. And that seed comes right up with your knife. Then again, watching out for your fingers, pop it off the blade and you can throw it away. Well, before we proceed with guacamole, it looks like our turkey might be just about up to temperature. We don't see any more pink, 
it's almost all brown, but it still looks nice and juicy. So we don't want to overcook it. So I'll get out my trusty thermometer, make sure it's on and just stick up to that little notch where it widens into the ground meat. We're climbing, we're climbing, 157, 158, 160. So we're gonna give that just a few more minutes. It's gonna continue warming so that residual heat will definitely bring it up to 165. We're only five degrees away. Um, but that's something that you wanna check. If you are able to get a thermometer, you can get them at Gordon Food Service. You can get them online, like anything. Um, and there are some that are less expensive than others. Digital tends to be a little bit pricier, but usually you can find one for around $15, give or take. So I'm gonna put this in the sink to wash later before I ever use it again, because we don't want those germs transferred. Next. We're going to take our avocado and prepared a bowl to put our flesh into. So again, this one, even though it's gorgeous, is still a little bit soft, so I could easily scoop it out and just throw it in that bowl if I wanted to. But again, for the sake of demonstration, an easy way to get it out is to either peel the skin away or you can slice, again, very carefully. You don't want avocado hand. I cannot stress this enough. And just stop at the skin. So you're just putting your knife point into the avocado. It's a very soft flesh. And then the skin is pretty tough. So as long as you're being gentle and careful, you'll feel that skin when you stop. Um, so this is also a nice way if you're making something where you want your avocado slices or cubes to be a little bit prettier, you're making a nice display or some sushi, you can also just cut those ribbons down and then peel your skin off and spread it out. But we're mushing it up today. So I'm not going to bother to be quite that meticulous. And now that I've cut all the um, lengthwise lines, I'm going to cut across to make big cubes. And I'll do that with my other half as well. Oh, my other half. What a perfect way to describe an avocado. So now that we have our cubes going, I'm just going to fold those right out. Remember, I washed my hands after I cooked that turkey. You can also use a spoon like a civilized person if you'd like. Um, <laughs> I like getting a little bit messy in the kitchen. I always have my rags around. I'm consistently washing my hands all the time, so it doesn't really bother me to get some avocado on my thumb. So now that those are in there, just gonna give this a quick rinse. And get back to the rest of our ingredients for our guacamole. Now, I'm not too picky. I'm not going to be uh, a rule enforcer on how guacamole is supposed to be. I personally like mine with more chunks, more veggies, more color, more flavor. If you like your guacamole to be just mushed up avocado, go for it. You can absolutely do that. Whatever is most appealing to you. You don't have to keep stirring that forever if you don't want, we'll just turn it down. Awesome. And I won't forget to add my other spices to that turkey. And we'll just give it a quick stir in a minute. So we've got our avocado and now I saved the other half of the half, so technically a quarter of our red onion, uh, just to add to our avocado. So I'll have that prepared. Um, I have a little bit more cilantro that we've already prepared from that stem that I showed you earlier. So we've dumped that in. We'll get um, a little bit of garlic. And now these are the items that you want to mush together. You'll notice that I haven't added my onions yet because that sort of hinders the mushing process. Or my tomatoes, because we don't want those to be any mushier than they already are. You want to retain some crisp freshness. So I just have a fork. You might use a potato masher. You could have any number of things that'll just get that job done. 
Like I said, I like mine chunky. If you want it super smooth, you could always use a blender or a food processor. I personally don't see the need for that. It's just another thing to clean, but that's how I like mine. And I'll add a little bit of our lime juice as well. I already rolled this one out and cut it in half so I can just give it a squeeze. And this lime serves as a little bit more than just flavor and flavor mixer. The lime has citric acid, which keeps the avocado from oxidizing. I don't know if you've ever seen an avocado or some really old guacamole that's been sitting out for a while that hasn't had lime juice added or some sort of citric acid added, but it gets brown. And once again, that won't hurt you, but it just doesn't look very appealing. So we've got our avocados mushed. We've got our lime juice in there, some cilantro, some garlic, and now we can add our onions as well as some tomatoes, nice and colorful. Got your oranges, which are really more red, and some purple, greens, lots of different kinds of antioxidants, healthy, healthy stuff in here. So now that we have this, if you store it for any amount of time, you're gonna wanna cover that still and keep the oxygen from getting to your avocado, keep it from getting brown. Um, but it doesn't need to sit for quite as long as your pico does to get all those flavors going. This is gonna take, taste awesome already. And I have just a few more spices left over. All, honestly, all of the spices that we used for the lentils and the turkey are very similar to what you'll be putting in your guacamole. So it really just depends on your preference, what you have on hand, what's easiest for you. I will say, that even if I don't have access to some other spices, cumin always goes in guacamole. It makes it amazing. So now we have our turkey lentil tacos ready to assemble. We'll add our lentils, which have the onions and the garlic to the turkey. Oh yeah, nice and sizzling. And give that a good mix. So again, if you're a veg head like me, you can make just the lentils mixture. Um, if you just want turkey and you don't wanna mess with lentils, you don't want extra vitamins and fiber and all the good things that come with lentils, you can just go for turkey. But, it makes a really good way to get a little bit more moisture, a little bit more nutrients, and stretch that more expensive meat because I paid $1 for that 16 ounce can of lentils and four and a half dollars for the 16 ounces of turkey. So just consider that when you're weighing in your mind which you wanna spend your money on. So now I'll grab our tortillas. which have been warming up in our oven, just on warm, not on bake or broil. You don't wanna recook them. And you can just take your now very pliable, flexible corn tortilla and add a little scoop of your turkey lentil mixture. Will you grab the pickle for me please? a little bit of guacamole and some pico de gallo. Again, I love all of this, so I don't need to use a second utensil, but if you wanted to split that up, obviously you could. You don't have to use one fork for everything. So these are all of our ingredients and this is our basic taco, which is absolutely delicious, of course. But if you wanna add a few other things, that's also very good. I personally brought with me one of my favorite hot sauces, the smoky chipotle pepper hot sauce. This is a Kroger Simple Truth Organic. I'm a sucker for organic things, but I usually go with this. You could also do sriracha, uh, tapatio, many different options. I also brought some shredded cheese 
there is a four cheese Mexican blend, but I happen to have cheddar around, which is still delicious. And um, lastly, I have Greek yogurt here. You may be wondering how Greek yogurt could possibly go with this taco. I use this as a sour cream substitute. And if you like sour cream, totally fine. Not trying to harsh your mellow. But this uh, plain organic Greek yogurt uh, with no fat, no sugar added, has a very similar taste and consistency uh, to sour cream. And it's packed with protein. You don't have any saturated fats. So it's a little bit more heart healthy and just as delicious. So you can add that for a nice cooling factor when you inevitably get too much hot sauce on there like I always do. So this has been Turkey Lentil Taco with pico de gallo and guacamole. I hope that you've enjoyed this cooking demonstration and maybe learned something new, been inspired to try something different. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for joining.